Hey y'all, what's up? It's your girl Gabs and welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about the essay that Martin Scorsese wrote for Harper's Magazine because I have thoughts. Uh, before we get started, I want to let you guys know if you want to read his essay, I'm putting the link in the description box below. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a like. Let me know what you think about this overall essay and of course my own sentiments and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. With that being said, let's get into it. Okay, so if you may or may not know, Mars Scorsese recently wrote an essay for Harper's Magazine. Uh, the essay mostly consists of Martin Scorsese fangirling over Federico Fellini. All of that part is fine. What I'm here to address are his sentiments about streaming services, which I generally disagreed with. So that's what I'm going to be talking shit about today. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into this article. I'm reading it straight from the website. So let me go ahead and find it. Okay, so the article initially begins with an insert from the script, eight and a half, and then he actually proceeds to actually start sharing his thoughts. And this is how it goes. Uh, flash forward to the present day as the art of cinema is being systematically devalued, sidelined, demeaned, and reduced to its lowest common denominator content. Wow, such the drama queen, Martin Sheesh. As recently as 15 years ago, the term content was heard only when people were discussing the cinema on a serious level, and it was contrasted with and measured against form. With, then gradually, it was used more and more by the people who took over media companies, most of whom knew nothing about the history of the art form or even cared enough to think that they should. Content became a business term for all moving images, a David Lean movie, a CAD video, a Super Bowl commercial, a superhero sequel, a series episode. It was linked, of course, not to the not to the theatrical experience, but to home viewing on the streaming platforms that have come to overtake the movie going experience, just as Amazon overtook physical stores. On the one hand, this has been good for filmmakers, myself included. On the other hand, it has created a situation in which everything is presented to the viewer on a level playing field, which sounds more democratic but isn't. If further viewing is suggested by algorithms based on what you've already seen and the suggestions are based only on a subject matter or genre, then what does that do uh, to the art of cinema? Okay, let's pause and I'm going to just share my thoughts just going based off that off the jump. Okay, so my key takeaways from that first paragraph um, are the following. So the first is he's linking watching films like from home is the only time they're really considered content. Like the movie going experience is not what people would call viewing content. You only feel like you're viewing content if you're watching it from home. I agree with that. I definitely think that if I go to a movie, if I go to like a show, I'm not going to call it content. But if I'm home, specifically if I'm watching it like from a computer or a smart TV or a smartphone, it feels like content. So I can understand that. I can also understand the reservations of even calling movies content. I personally would not call movies themselves content, but I can understand calling it content Whew, the word content is a weird word. Let's just stop and talk about that for a second. You can use the word content in three different ways, but one of which it's pronounced differently. Here is a phrase to help you understand if you're not really like immediately thinking about the different meanings of the word content. As a content creator, I like to make sure that the contents of my content leave people feeling content. So like content content, it's like pronounced differently, but it's spelled exactly the same. So I'm a content creator who creates content. I'm creating media for people to experience. And what consists of the content is also called the contents. So the contents of the content. So like I can understand contents like the contents of a stream are you keeping up with me a co the contents of a streaming service or movies and tv i would not call them per se content but they are filling up the streaming service i think we got the point the point is this he doesn't like calling movies content i don't like calling movies content so we can agree to that i can understand that sentiment and then he goes on to say that streaming in the same sentence he's saying that streaming is overtaking like the movie going experience and i definitely agree with that sentiment that that is true that is a fact and i'm in the boat that it's better but i'm also in the boat like oh damn i like going to the movies i like going to the movies when everybody up in there the only time i have ever seen a movie where the entire shit was packed was get out 
And that was a pretty lit experience. Like, I was sitting next to black people, so that shit was pretty fun. But other than that, I don't like going to the movies when everybody is packed up in there. I think a few other times, like when I went with people, like to see... Actually, I lied. I've been to the movie numerous of times where there are people in the audience. I prefer when nobody's there. I like being the only person in the movie theater. I rule this bitch. That's my energy. Anyways, so streaming has taken over the movie going experience. Okay, boom. That's a fact. Um, then he goes on to say it's been good for filmmakers like himself. Now, this is where I start to deviate, okay? I feel like this was a detail that he glossed over. Let's read the actual sentence that he said. He said, on the one hand, this has been good for filmmakers, myself included. I don't think really that's fully true, like himself included. He'd be good regardless, regardless whether it's a theatrical release or if it's online. What I've seen is that streaming services are actually great great for like new filmmakers like or maybe not necessarily new but like unknown filmmakers i.e most filmmakers Martin Scorsese is an industry giant his name is the brand it don't matter what he's doing if his name is slapped on it whether he wrote it he directed or he executive produced it he's got plenty of fans that are gonna run and go watch whatever his name is slapped on look at shark tale so personally i feel like he's kind of glossing over the benefits of streaming and really reserving space to whine and complain about why he doesn't think that they're really given what he feels like he wants them to be given like i think what he's really looking for is a regression towards going back to the movies and that whole sort of thing because in the entire essay where he's actually going in about his appreciation of federico fellini him talking about his experience meeting fellini and just all his other very passionate thoughts about the matter um he is interweaving thoughts about how important the movie going experience was for him and i definitely relate to that like actually physically going is great like i like i can't disagree with that but we're also in an age where in america we've been in a pandemic for over a year because we suck and so going to the movies you literally like can't and i'm definitely in the boat of being sad about it but i'm not really mad about it because i do like being able to be as I am and watch a new movie, you know, like that is revolutionary. Streaming services are really good for new, unknown, and upcoming filmmakers. Um, I'm in a new group on Facebook for black filmmakers and every day somebody is saying they have a new movie that's about to be released on like Amazon Prime. I did not know you could do that. That's news to me. I did not know you could get your movie just <laughs> uploaded to Amazon Prime. I'm sure it's not no piece of cake, but this is not the symbol for a piece of cake. But either way, people are getting their, their films are getting them uploaded to these streaming platforms and that's miraculous. The type of reach that you can get now with streaming services is phenomenal. So he'd be good regardless if he on a streaming service or he release it in the theaters, people are coming for him. Because he made it, they're like, oh, I'm going to go watch this. I'm not saying that's everybody. Obviously, if the movie looked good, the movie looked good, you know, but... My point still stands. He a brain. He a whole giant, like, in the industry. So that's the point that I wanted to make. Because then he proceeds to say, on the other hand, it has created a situation in which everything is presented to the viewer on a level playing field, which sounds democratic, but isn't. How is it not? I feel like, if anything, like, his existence ain't really democratic, you know? Like, and I mean in the sense of him uploading his stuff to, like, a streaming service, people are going to watch that automatically. These independent films, they got to rely on, on Netflix to not half-ass them on a bio because I don't think they get to make it. And then the, 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 the movie poster and the genre that it's in and what it's similar to, like, how it fits into the algorithm in accordance to other stuff. Um, to me, that's pretty level. You're competing with all these other titles from other independent makers because Netflix is a 
combination of well-known filmmakers and, and TV showrunners, uh, and then unknown indie films we never heard of, Netflix originals, shitty Netflix originals, and then Netflix originals that they purchase from independent filmmakers. So, and so it just keeps going. The type of stuff that fills that website, the contents of the website is a whole, whole pot of different types of productions from different levels of experience, perceptions, ideas, and talent. So I think it actually, I personally think it's a level playing field. I think it is putting people like Mark Scorsese on the same level as people who are producing stuff and getting deals like, and who are much lesser known, but become, but can become well known because they have a deal on Netflix or HBO Max or, or, or Hulu or, or whatever, whatever, you know, Amazon, whatever. So I think that he's wrong. I think he's wrong. Um, and then the last sentence of this paragraph, he's like, if further viewing is suggested by algorithms based on what you've already seen and the suggestions are based on subject matter or genre, then what does that do for the art of cinema? I think it makes it easier for the consumer to have more control over what they watch. I have always been an advocate for the audience to be vocal about what they want to see from filmmakers. We are in an age now where it is disgustingly easy to get in contact with people and because of that people need to be taking very much advantage about the type of media they want to see and we see that every day on all of the social media platforms i mean shit twitter bullied the producers of that sonic movie so badly like they cruised like ripped that movie to shred so much they went back and re-edited that whole film and changed the face of the sonic character that's what i'm talking about so for me i think that it's great that we now have algorithms that can adjust themselves to the very tastes that people are looking for but Let's go on and keep reading what he has to say. Curating is an undemocratic or elitist, a term that is now used so often that it becomes meaningless. I'm not even going to continue that paragraph because I have to say this. Martin. Sir. I need you to go ask everybody below the poverty line, which is surprisingly larger than we like to admit that it is, if the term elitist is meaningless. Only a pretentious elitist snob would say something so dumb. The term elitist is used so often it's become meaningless. I'll say you mad that you've been called out before. That's, that's what I'm getting. He continues to say, in terms of curation, it's an act of generosity. You're sharing what you love and what has inspired you. Uh, and then he mentions the best streaming uh, platforms that do Curation would be like the Criterion Collection channel and UB, I think I said that right, um, and traditional outlets such as TCM are based on curating. Um, algorithms, by definition, are based on calculations that treat the viewer as a consumer and nothing else. I understand that sentiment and I do think it's correct, but I don't think it's that, that basic. Um, I think that yes, the algorithms are based on calculations made specifically by that person. So if I watch something, if I press the thumbs up, because you can like stuff on Netflix, um, not just YouTube, but you can, well, no, you can actually do that with any platform. You can let them know, oh, I like this, oh, I don't like this. You're telling the algorithm what you want to be seen presented in front of you. You know, this is more interaction from the viewer's part on what they could see and do, but he is, uh, a curating fan. Okay, so he goes on to say the choices made by distributors such as Amos Vogel at Grove Press back in the 60s were not just acts of generosity but, but quite often bravery. Um, he continues to go on and talk a little bit more um, about these different like curators and then he also continues to say like how lucky he was to be alive around these times and then he says at the end the cinema has always been much more than content, and it always will be. And the years when those films were coming out all over the world, talking to each other and redefining the art form on a weekly basis are the proof. So, 
I agree that I don't think that movies are just content. And I can understand that the term content definitely can make it feel like it's kind of taking away the magic that films do for people, uh, more specifically film buffs and lovers, because I think for the average show that's like, not me, um, they're like, I just need something to do. I need something entertaining to watch. It's not necessarily like magical, but for some it is and for some it isn't. And that's perfectly okay. And then in the following paragraph, he talks about how during that time in the 60s, filmmakers were always attempting to answer the question, what is cinema? And they were answering it with their films. And then the next person would ask that question and answer it with their film when it was kind of like this really artsy, like back and forth sort of thing. So that's what he's like, kind of the underlying thing that's going on in this essay is like, what is cinema? What is happening to it? And, and what is streaming services doing for it? And I, I understand like these are very valid questions and I'm totally here for them. But um, the way he's approaching it just don't really make a lot of sense to me. I don't really understand how you can be whining about streaming services when you like literally like produced a three and a half hour movie that was uploaded to a streaming service and in this essay, he mentions that he has another film coming out that's going to be released on Apple TV. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how you can, how you can do both. How you can complain about the lack of curation in these streaming services being problematic. And then you yourself actually allowing for your productions, your work to be uploaded to these platforms. And let's be clear, I don't know many people that's going to go sit in a movie theater in the late 2010s, early 2020s for a three and a half hour movie. That's something you do on a Sunday. I, I really wouldn't go to the movie theater for that long of a movie. I am amazed that people went to go see um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because it seems so long. But also, this is not a Quentin Tarantino video, I'ma cut his ass on a different day. To me, I can only speak for myself. Just remember, I'm only speaking for myself. I think it's a little like narrow-minded to be all upset about the lack of curation. And my question is, if you really want curation to keep happening, then I want a full breakdown about who gets to do it. That's my question for Martin is, who gets to do the curation? And then on top of that, how is the curator decided? What requirements do they need to have to be curating stuff? And then at the same time, what standards are these films being judged on? And how inclusive are the requirements? Are they being inclusive to all forms and perspectives of cinema? Because historically, they haven't. That's the T. That's the T. Historically, like, if you look at these amazing list of phenomenal movies, they're all white. And no, I don't want to hear about, you know, black people or Asian people, Hispanic people were not producing films because that's bullshit. Okay? People of any sort of background have always been making movies since the invention of the film camera. But white films had the priority in preservation. But also, let's talk about preservation. Let's talk about, like, curation in that sense. Like, one of the big reasons, like, we even, they even did curation was because storage of film was really expensive and very difficult. Like, and not to mention access was so hard to have. And that's why I'm like, how can you complain about streaming services not being curated? We cannot sit here and curate every movie. You mean to tell me that we should only curate like the best of the best and do what with the others? Not upload them? I'm sure that's not what he's insinuating, but it can be insinuated based on what he's saying, in my opinion. But like I said before, the preservation of film was so important back then because it was really easy for film to get like destroyed, not be well kept, you know? So curation was important. We wanted to preserve really good movies because they might not stick with us. You know, there are millions, well, maybe not millions, or maybe there are, we don't know how many lost films there are, you know? So I can understand curation back then and how important it was to really keep a firm collection of some top movies. But at the same time, they have roots in white supremacy because it was ruled by white men. I'm not here for any disagreement about this particular part of what I have to say. Like, 
it feels just really elitist to me um what he's saying and it's very pretentious and listen i'm here for pretentious film snobbery but not in this particular way not when we are in an age where access to films is the easiest it's ever been. I recognize and am so grateful for the amount of access that we have to be able to watch stuff now. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I couldn't care less if the stuff was curated. I think it's important that people are able to have the freedom to choose what they want to watch based on what they like watching. And the algorithm is designed to do that. It's also designed to keep people on these websites for as long as possible. And that's that's another thing too. That's a whole nother conversation about the effects of internet and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say the word social media because these aren't social media platforms, but it is something to be said about our planet's addiction to interacting with the internet, like always having to be on it, always having to be watching something. And then these websites are designed to keep us on there for as long as possible. They're making money from us doing that. They have to make a profit because they're giving us all these movies for a set price per month or per year, depending on your plan. But I think that this is actually a great step for cinema because now if if people can actually get access to that data of what people are watching, people can make stuff that's geared more towards what people want. Some people are the type of artists that they want to make what other people are really want to watch. Like... For instance, I'm in a black filmmakers group like on Facebook and every once in a while people are asking what are the type of stories y'all want to see because of the lack of representation people want to know what do y'all want to see? What do y'all want to watch? What fantasy are you looking for? My opinion is that old Hollywood was very, very strategic and determined to use cinema as a tool to perpetuate white fantasies. And now we're in an age where we don't want that. But the thing is, is that I don't think literally anybody besides people ever really wanted what they were giving, but we could appreciate the fact that it was really good work. But at the same time, I think that we should also acknowledge the fact that the industry was dominated by white men for decades. And so not saying that your faves aren't amazing, but what I am saying is that everybody's favorite white man, filmmaker, white male filmmaker, they were unchallenged and dripping with privilege. And that's what I got from this. I know you may feel like I'm reaching and I want to let you know I did stretch before I start. Okay, like I really do think that... Um, what he's saying is really like of yesteryear, like 20, 30 years ago. He'd been in the game for what, 50, 60 years at this point? The man's damn near 80, still producing films. Kudos to him. I guess you can give with the times and miss the old times, but to say that like, you know, the lack of curation is undemocratic, it's just really pretentious and dumb. What are you saying, Martin? What are you saying? Are you mad that your film is on the same level as the newbies? Are you mad that television now has the unlimited capacity to tell stories with a cinematic look? Like, this is, like, unprecedented the way TV is developed. Th the point is this. Everything's fair game now. You people can watch whatever they want to watch, and the algorithm is going to make sure that, that they get specifically what they're looking for. When I finished watching The Queen's Gambit, I was so mentally stimulated. I was so thirsty for something similar, but not the exact same thing. Like, I wanted something that gave me the energy that Queen's Gambit was given, you know? So I had to look at the tags of the, of the TV show and it had things like cerebral. So I was like, oh, that sounds like stuff that I like. I like stuff that's like makes me think or is like a little deep. I got to really sit and watch and like pay attention to every single detail or I'm going to miss a few things. I like that. That's the genre I like. And I want to see more stuff. I want to see more stuff. So that's what I like about it. And if I'm going off of uh, a curator, it's like, well, what, what requirements do they have? And what do those requirements mean to me? You know, a lot of these curators are like, wait. And there are many times you can go talk to a black person and they're not going to think certain things in uh, white American comedies are funny. 
There are times when I'm hanging out with white people and I'm like, oh, let's watch this movie. I had, I literally put on Barbershop and I was with one of my white friends and he didn't laugh at all. And he's like, I don't think this is very funny. And I'm like, I don't think you understand the references. Uh, I'm going to say this now. Um, white does not equal universal. And that is the this most disgusting trick white supremacy has ever placed on any human being is believing that whiteness is universal. It ain't. Now, I can say that statement and simultaneously say there are stories that can be universal, but the presentation of it is going to be molded based off of the cultural identity of who's ever playing it. You can't be colorblind. There's no such thing as that. So don't even do that shit. Um, I am definitely not in the boat of writing characters uh, without knowing what their race is. It's like so not understanding people. I think only white people do that shit. Another point I want to talk about is the romanticization of old cinema. And I'm specifically talking about movies made prior to 19... I would say prior to 1970, because that's right around that blockbuster renaissance started. But I would actually dare to say movies prior to 1960. Um, they're a little more difficult to watch because of the... Because of literally everything that happens in those movies. But also, I want to point out that not every movie ever made was great. In the beginning of the essay, he states the art of cinema is being systematically devalued, sidelined, demeaned, and reduced to its lowest common denominator content. And I think, again, he's being a melodramatic queen about the situation. I think it just depends how you look at it. I don't look at calling stuff content on a streaming service as a devaluing thing. I'm thinking about the word as the what the website consists of. Um, the contents of the website, like a table of contents, the contents of the website, but not necessarily the films and TV shows being called content. I would call things on TikTok and YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, I would call that stuff content, but I can put all of that under the umbrella of media I would call that stuff media I would call film media like when I went to college my degree is in film and media studies so I don't think it's as dramatic as he's making it but I can understand the sentiment behind it but again I definitely think he's romanticizing old cinema and that's fine because that was his heyday like that was that was peak cinema for him. And I agree, there's some phenomenal work that was made during that time. But again, um, not everybody is a pretentious cinephile. So they're not going to be this demanding about the specifics of movies, but more so be demanding about the access to movies and the types of movies people want to watch. I'm glad we're like in an age where you don't have to watch certain movies to be uh, a certain type of way. There are plenty of movies that a so-called filmmaker is supposed to have seen that I definitely haven't seen all of them. And I'm like, so are we just going to spend our time just like constantly glorifying this one particular um, group of filmmakers? Or are we going to give the most recent ones their flowers too? And also recognize that um, personally, I think curation is like not fully necessary for the common everyday experience. Websites like the Criterion Collection is great for that because they are very inclusive of not just American cinema, but international cinema. And that's what I'm here for too. But yeah, I don't fully disagree with Martin, but I don't agree with a lot of sentiments. I just think that he was just being a pretentious film snob when he just wanted to share his white people tears about it. Um, like I said before, I am in the boat that curation is not necessary anymore. I think for certain films, yes, but I also think it was really hypocritical for him to um, spend time in this really nice article about one of his favorite filmmakers. He decided that he wanted to use this article to also complain about streaming services and what it's doing to the industry. 
um, while simultaneously benefiting from it. Um, it's a little different than when a poor person complains about capitalism, but they still have to do things in capitalism because they're stuck in the, the society that's built that way. And then when you are like in the top 1%, like one of the biggest film directors like ever, and you are posting to these very websites that you are disappointed in for their lack of curation and claiming that it's devaluing films that like what these streaming services are doing are devaluing films because they're being referred to as content and yet you simultaneously are using these platforms to post your content bro you're in yesteryear this is revolutionary the fact that people can watch movies at any time and they have access to, I wouldn't say any movie, but a <laughs> like, like, people have so much more access and input about what can happen with movies. And I think that's important. Because if you know your film history, and I don't just mean American film history, I mean internationally, you can see throughout history how movies have not only been reflective of the times, but have been involved in actively shaping it. Like, actively trying to morph a whole society into something different. Reinforce certain ideals. I learned that taking an East German cinema class, the way they were using movies to reinforce East German ideals and standards and beliefs. Anti-capitalist, pro-communism, like all of that. Subliminally, I can't say the word, subliminally, subliminally in the movies. In the movies, in the movies, like propaganda. Straight up, like, like for real. And now people have more input about what they want to watch. Netflix is looking at the charts. They are looking at the numbers. And they are seeing, not just Netflix, but like, all of these streaming services are watching what we're watching. And they're seeing what needs to be made next to keep the people on this website, to keep them happy. Yes, I agree. That is treating them like a consumer. But that's not a bad thing. You can actually, as a filmmaker, take it to an advantage. I think there's a way to combine being an auteur, being an artistic soul on a spiritual journey, using film as your medium of expression, but simultaneously appealing to an audience that is absolutely going to watch your film. Now, people like Mari, he can make whatever he wants. Okay, like, I don't even need to watch The Irishman to know it's, like, a combination of, like, Departed, The Departed, and, what's it called? Goodfellas. I haven't seen all of his repertoire, but we can all agree his movies are so long. Like, like thank the Lord that they have platforms like streaming services so I could watch a long-ass movie in my bed instead of sitting on a movie seat with a room full of strangers. It's like people have social anxiety. People are nasty. Like there are so many reasons why you don't need to go to a movie theater. I mean, the prices alone, hello, if I'm paying like $14 a month for like the highest package of like Netflix and then I get access to like hundreds of movies and I don't got to sit next to a stranger or pay $12 for a hot dog. You damn skippy, I'm going to stay home, sir. Like, let's not forget those movie prices went up. I remember being a kid and going to the movies and they used to be cheap. And by the time I was like, I don't know, nine, we went to the movie theaters. It was like $11 and we went in the daytime. What? My grandmother used to take me to the movies all the time. And we used to sneak in Twizzlers because who was paying for that however priced food? Like, I don't want to have to spend, like, $50 at the movies. And imagine people who have families. You know, you got to pay for each little kid's ticket. I'm too selfish for that. No. <laughs> no. No. So there are many reasons why I believe that moving towards being able to watch stuff in your own home is, like, groundbreaking. Please, people are more than willing to buy stuff like flat screen, large smart TVs, make their living rooms, make their homes into some, into some sort of home theater. People make the theater at home. 
I think that's even better. Like personalizing the movie experience. Like that is so different. The way watching movies is evolving. I don't know where we're going to go. I don't know where else we could go. Where are we going? But I'm excited about the journey. And I think, again, the audience being able to choose what they want to watch is revolutionary instead of depending on the opinions of white men with very thick, pretentious opinions. <laughs> like, for real. I don't have to depend on your opinion of a movie anymore. I can pick my own movie. Now, I do think that it's great to have a collection of, like, I don't know what's happening here, but, like, a collection of, like, top-tier movies. Yes, but they're all very, like, subjective. Because I'll be watching some of these classic movies, and I'm like, this it? Uh, to sum up the gist of my thoughts, um, I think Martin Scorsese is a melodramatic drama queen, and I actually am 100% here for it, but I also think he might want to check his white privilege just a little bit. Also, just his privilege as one of the leading directors in the American film industry. Uh, he might want to check himself just a little bit. Um, don't be coming out here to talk about elitist is meaningless. Only an elitist would say something so dumb. Like what? That shit had me laughing for a couple minutes. It was like meaningless. Yo, Martin, how much you get? <laughs> like, how much you get paid? Also, um, I said it once, I say it a thousand times. Um, white people were using cinema as a tool to perpetuate white fantasies. Uh, curation plays a role in that, in uplifting white creations. Because historically, they fill up the roster of iconic movies. I'm not dumb. I know there's plenty of other uh, non-white people that have produced films that are iconic and that are top tier, god tier even. I'm not dumb. But the majority of the list is white. And these filmmakers dripping in privilege with no challenge happening at all. Now, people have a chance. People have a chance to get their stories out there, and that is impressive. Now, with that being said, yeah, you're going to get an influx of a bunch of different type of stuff. And you have to weed through the stuff that you're going to like and not like. But the thing is, you can have a list of curated stuff, but there are plenty of people who like terrible movies. Please, one of my favorite movies is The Room. That movie is so bad, it's exquisite. Put that on a curation list. I dare y'all. Please do. It deserves it. Like, come on. There's plenty. I like Adam Sandler movies from the mid-2000s. Not all of them because I'm not, I'm not that up. But some of them I rock with. Put that on a curation list. Like, y'all not going to do that. They're going to think they're like low-quality movies. And like, there are different reasons why people watch movies. People watch movies because they want to feel good. They want a distraction. They want to learn something. They want... they People have their own really interweb, connected reasons why they watch something. Please. My favorite movie was Clueless growing up, and it still is. And the reason why I gravitated towards that movie was because Alicia Silverstone reminded me of my best friend that moved away in the third grade. That's, that's why I gravitated towards that movie as a 10-year-old. And it's still my favorite movie today. People have their own intricate reasons. And while I am in the boat of enjoying true artistic cinema, like a true film snob, I'm also in the same boat where I can recognize reality and most people don't think that way. They just trying to relax. <laughs> like they just trying to relax. They trying to watch a movie that's going to entertain them. Or they got to watch it for class. Or it's family time. I think there is a place for everything. And websites like Netflix and HBO Max and Hulu and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus or whatever. All that stuff is for the everyday person. If you're looking for... You're, don't go there. That's not the place to go. Go to Criterion Collection. That's where you need to be. Go to Canopy. That's where you need to be. But not where the average Joe is chilling to relax after work. 
or to keep themselves occupied during quarantine. This isn't the place to be looking for curation. This is the place to explore different types of media and giving a platform to most filmmakers who may or may not ever get the worldwide acclaim and acknowledgement like Martin Scorsese. He ain't been an independent filmmaker in a very long time. I'm talking about the broke bitches like us. He ain't been on the floor in a very long time. And you can tell from this. Most of the essay is him fangirling about Fellini. I don't have a problem with it. I think I got like 75% of the way through. And I was like, okay, I had enough. Like, okay, I get it. Like... Um, and I'm not knocking him for fangirling because, girl, please, that's what I do on this channel. I just couldn't read it anymore. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. The last things I want to say is that compared to how it used to be, like, just just fi from 15 years ago to beyond, you don't have to force the neighborhood to watch a movie anymore. You can force the world to watch it. You put it online, anybody can watch it. That's revolutionary. You don't need some big, giant movie studio behind you. You can do it yourself. Uh, revolutionary. You know, and there is a plethora of low-budget masterpieces out there that are never going to get the critical acclaim they deserve because they don't have the Mars Scorsese brand, the Mars Scorsese money, the white privilege, the male privilege. But it's out there and you got to sift through it. I see all sorts of gems all over the place. On YouTube. Yes. I go digging on YouTube. There are some gems on this website. That. Netflix. Hulu. All of them hoes. All of those streaming services. Have some hidden gems interwoven in them. In them. But they may or may not ever get the flowers they deserve. Because they don't have the Martin Scorsese brand. And he over here complaining about a lack of curation. Sir, get your three and a half hour movie ass out of here. No. No. I'm not doing it with you today. No. No. Finally, I want to acknowledge uh, his question about where does cinema go from here? What is cinema? That has been a question that's been asked since the beginning of the industry. This question will never have a definitive answer because it's art, because it's it's human, it's us, it's expression, it's subjective, it's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world because it is synonymous with art. Personally, I think it's synonymous with life itself. See, I can be a mushy gushy artist too, and those are my thoughts on the matter. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed what I said here today, please be sure to give this video a like or dislike it if you don't like what anything I had to say. And let me know in the comments what you thought. And subscribe for more. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.